Here now is Matt Austin and Ginger Gadston with Florida's Fourth Estate. Sponsored by Light Orlando, delivering hope together. Pythons are known for eating mammals. She's the Florida scientist who made a wild discovery. Because they like brought it in and we stretched out the python, which literally took up the entire room. You could really see like the outline of the alligator. But she does more than study wildlife. So I think it's kind of cool to be able to show both sides or show girls that it's cool to be a scientist. How she's also inspiring young girls to pursue careers in science. But first. Welcome to Florida's Fourth Estate. You know, Matt, we live in perhaps arguably the greatest state in the union, right? Is there an argument? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't remember being I'm not. <laughs> There's so many great things to do here. You you almost can't do them all, but before you die, you should try a few things that are simply must-dos in Florida. Hi, everyone. I'm Ginger Gadsden. Hey, glad you're with us today on Florida's Fourth Estate. My name is Matt Austin, and Ginger and I We talk our fair share of mess about Florida, but truly we adore this state. And there are so many amazing things to do in the state that people just don't take advantage of. Some of them cost money, which we're going to talk about, but our favorites Mm -hmm. are the free ones. So here we go. Let's get out the big stamp and we're going to go. Yeah. (laughs) Things to do in Florida before you die. The top five. Of course, Matt said some of them are free. We're going to start with the ones that are not. Uh, (laughs) Theme parks. (laughs) It was honestly just delightful when I originally moved here or anytime I would visit Florida because you have to come to a theme park. But people who are born here and raised here, sometimes they just don't take advantage of something that's right in their own backyard. And you just get to become a kid again. I love Disney. I know a lot of people can't afford it. They're raising prices once again. But look at that. They just celebrated 50 years. And you don't get to celebrate 50 years by people not coming. (laughs) Right. (laughs) It is just, it really is one of the most magical places because you get there and you just kind of get lost and you forget that, Oh, wow. There's a world outside of these gates. And don't we all need that every once in a while? I also love Universal because there are free spots there. You can go to City Walk and just have a a good lunch and just kind of meet up with some friends or whatever and then go your separate ways. But uh, honestly, if you don't go to a theme park here in Central Florida at least once in your life, you are really, really missing out. It's it's so worth whatever it's going to cost and it's going to cost. Look, we know a lot of Florida is swamp. It's just the way it is. But when people think of swamp, they don't think of something cool and exciting and beautiful. But in fact, it is. It's a pretty amazing place if you get to go out and check out an airboat ride. It's the best way to see Florida, in my opinion. Some people who don't know much about it think, why not just take a boat out there? Well, you cannot go to these places in just a normal boat because you've got an engine and a propeller that's mm-hmm. shooting you across. But if you take one of these airboats, these shallow swamps, you can cruise across. And I've been on one before where we went out and we found alligator eggs and you could see the moms guarding the eggs. And you're seeing sometimes if you time it right, you can see the little hatchlings. And there's just something super cool about getting out there on a Florida swamp in an airboat, which is just so loud and fast and fun. It really is. It deserved a spot on this list, Ginger. Yeah, you know, I did my first one just a couple of months ago, and I did it because my seven-year-old nephew, Ari, was coming to town, and I'm like, what is something he would like to do? Turns out, Auntie Gigi liked it even more than Ari. (laughs) It was so much fun, and what people don't realize is you don't have to go to the Everglades, because honestly, you think of airboats and you think of Everglades automatically. We were in Central Florida. We were in Osceola County. We went to this place called Boggy Creek, and it was phenomenal, and the airboat the airboat captains, they give you the history, and we did. We spotted some gators. We spotted eagles. It was just really a beautiful, beautiful experience, and I I would highly recommend it to anyone. I was here eight years before I even thought 
of doing it. And I only did it because I thought someone else would enjoy it. So I think more people than not would enjoy it. it it's not cheap, cheap, but it's not theme park expensive either. And, you know, I would do it for an hour. You have, you can do it for 30 minutes or an hour. An hour wasn't even long enough. It was just, it, it really was a, an awesome experience. And it's a great way to get out and experience uh, nature. And you're right, you hear swamp and you think, ugh, it sounds kind of yucky, but it's beautiful. Allow me, if you will, to paint a picture. You're, you're, Please do, my you're, lady. <laughs> you're, you're walking on a Florida beach. The time, sunset. What are you going to do? You're going to stop and you're going to watch the sunset. You don't even have to be at a Florida beach to enjoy the sunsets here. And I think it is arguably one of the most beautiful times of day because you made it. You completed that day. A lot of hard work probably went into it. And there's some satisfaction of seeing it just dip below the horizon. And you almost want to applaud. It's like, thank you. You warmed us up. You kept us all alive today. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> it's just, And that is something free you can do uh, on a clearer Florida evening, even on your, your front porch, your back porch, at your pool. It just anywhere and it really just makes you take pause and appreciate that particular day I just, sunsets no two are alike i don't care where you are or how many how long you've lived in florida each one is unique and each one is beautiful and i'm so thankful for all of them and that's the free thing on our list <laughs> Okay, so maybe the sunset wasn't the only free thing on our list. The next thing on our list is something also very magical. And if you happen to be doing it during sunset, I think that's also pretty cool. But now you need to just cue the Jimmy Buffett music. Can't you hear it in your head? I'm talking about the Keys Highway, also known as the Overseas Highway. I mean, look at that thing. It's not cone, but it's beautiful. <laughs> You're bringing in the cone kid to this episode? <laughs> it's so great. The water, it's 113 miles long, Matt. And it takes you right into Key West, which is another place that is just magical unto itself. But if you're looking for a scenic drive in Florida, mm. this has got to be the one. It's water on both sides. You know, you're Love seeing that. golf, you're seeing Atlantic. It's mm -hmm. all there. You pass through these cool little keys areas with these amazing little names you see the little key deer on the side of the road if you're lucky oh yeah and it's just a great drive to enjoy if you're in florida and hopefully there's a destination at the end because usually you're not driving the whole thing you know i've driven yeah. to a certain key you know to yeah and and you get to your key and then you're you've just done this beautiful drive and then you're here yeah. so it's it is wonderful that was a good call i like that pick of yours Thank you. But it's not as good as this one. <laughs> to make it to number one on the list of amazing things to do in Florida, you better be pretty awesome. Well, guess what? <laughs> this one's awesome. This one is my personal <laughs> favorite thing to do in Florida. It's not quite free, but it's really not expensive at all. So let me take you to a magical place called Blue Spring State Park, not Blue Springs. If you say Springs, people will yell at you. It's only one yes. spring. Oh, but in the winter the time, so don't go in the summer. You can't go in the summer. It's fine. You can swim around and all that. But in the winter time, they shut down the spring to people, and the only ones allowed in are these creatures. It is amazingly clear. You can see to the bottom from these boardwalks that you walk from, and then there are manatees. If you go on a chilly day, Oh, they're everywhere. They're shoulder to shoulder, all snuggled in like these giant teddy bears around what to them is warm water. Because in the wintertime, these rivers get a little chilly. And coming from this spring is 72 degree water all year round. So they come here oh. and you really get an up close look at these beautiful manatees. They're such cool creatures. If you've ever gotten to spend any time, they're playful. 
Again, you're not allowed to touch them in the state of Florida, but they're they will cute. come up to you in their they're, own way. Yeah. Kind of like I'm cute in my own way. Mm, you're pushing it. But okay. <laughs> That's what my wife tells me. Anyway, so that is our top list of Florida's things to do before you die. I would imagine we probably missed a couple. If you got an idea, if we missed something, let us know. Hit us up on social media, Florida's Fourth Estate. And make sure to stick around as we talk to the Florida woman who helped uncover a gator in the belly of a python about her wild discovery and how she's trying to get young girls interested in science. Hi there and welcome to Florida's Fourth Estate. We love introducing you to interesting characters who maybe don't fit into the normal boxes that we associate people in. Like say you have a scientist who studies alligators and sharks who also models on the side. That's the kind of person we're introducing you to today. Yeah, she is so fascinating because when you meet her, you say, oh, you do this? Oh, but you're also that? And it's like, oh my gosh, a total package. And we love it. And once you meet her, you will know why we wanted to speak with her and introduce her to the rest of you guys. Her name is Rosie Moore. And as Matt said, she is a scientist. She deals mostly with uh, reptiles and sharks. But she's also, as you can see by the visual on your screen, very beautiful. So uh, it makes sense that she's a model. Rosie, welcome to Florida's Fourth Estate. We're so happy you could join us. Yeah, thank you for having me, guys. So the way we found Rosie is because there was this story about a five-foot alligator that was found just whole inside an 18-foot python. Her team was inside. studying that. Yeah, it was inside. inside there. And so our producer was looking up, oh, I'd love to talk to one of these scientists. And our producer looked up, found Rosie on Instagram, and she was like, there's no way she's one of these scientists. I think I have the wrong person. Does this cause confusion in your life, the, the marriage of these two gigs that you have? Yeah, I think especially when the, the Python went viral, a lot of people were really surprised. That's probably the number one comment I saw in any video and stuff. They were more surprised that it was me that took the video compared to the predation event itself. So that was kind of shocking for me. Yeah, what I love about it, Rosie, is that I too did a deep dive into your social media because one, you, you click on your picture and it's like, oh my gosh, she's stunning. And this is, won't be the last time I say that you're stunning. Uh, so, and then you start going more into it. And by the time you're done with it, which was for me about a half hour later, I'm like, I just learned so much about so many different things. Why is it so important that young girls, especially because we're talking about, you know, you're in STEM. Why isn't it important for young girls to see someone like you at the helm of something like this? Yeah, you know, there's actually a lot of peer reviewed studies that have shown like people don't associate feminine qualities with scientists at all. And even if you look at media, there's not really any scientists that are portrayed as models or the model esque type or even just like feminine characters. So I think it's kind of cool to be able to show both sides and maybe like get other people's attention or show girls that it's cool to be a scientist because a lot of mainstream media is not doing that. Tell me a little bit about your background because you uh, studied at FAU and you also have your master's. You also got that at FAU. How did you become interested in, in particular, reptiles and sharks? Yeah, so I've always been into sharks. That was my big thing. Like when I went into college, I was like, I want to finish school and I want to work with sharks. So that was my whole goal in even getting a degree. And that's why I specialized in what I specialized in, doing the spatial tech because it's used a lot and shark tagging and things like that. So. I went into that and then halfway through grad school, there was a position open at a wildlife lab that specialized in herpetology, so snakes and crocodiles and alligators. So I was like, well, that's another apex predator that interests me. I was like, that would be really <laughs> into. So I ended up getting into that for a while and just doing the sharks on the side. And I really fell in love with the snakes as well and the crocs. Yeah, I'm fascinated uh, by you because I have daughters who are interested in doing big things like you're doing. And they're also, I think, very beautiful. And I have noticed as I've raised them that people just sort of put them in this this bucket. Like you are this thing and that, that's where you'll stay and this is how we're going to pay attention to you. If you were to give advice to, say, like a 14 or 17-year-old girl, what would you say to them? 
I always encourage people to find a hobby or a niche. I don't think there's enough people that are like pursuing hobbies, especially the younger generations. And it's like, there's so many cool things to get into. And I think finding something you're really passionate about and actually pursuing it and not really caring as much about aesthetics, which is so heavily pushed by society, but caring more about something you really truly love will take you so much further in life than caring more about the surficial things. So I'm fascinated because you also do free diving. What's the longest you can hold your breath? So my static is a 435, which is when you're not moving. That's like the pool training when you flip Mm -hmm. upside down, just doing intervals, like working your breath hold up. And then my max depth is 140. You've held your breath for four and a half minutes before? Yes. And it sounds crazy until you try it. Like when you train for it and like you actually do it, like I promise it's not as crazy as it sounds. We will take your word for it. We will not try it. We we will die. How do you figure that out? Do you black out like in the process of trying to get past your max amount? Like have you ever passed out? So I haven't blacked out, but you can black out. So you always do it with buddies, but it's a really interesting process where your body will like start having like these little convulsions. Like they kind of start Mm -hmm. in your stomach. I usually say that's like the beginning of your breath hold. And then by the time you're at like 435, like when your whole body is like involuntarily like convulsing and you just have to like mentally convince yourself to stay like as long as possible. Because all the the video of you uh, free diving in these Florida caves, it's very beautiful, but all of that is going on at the same time. I would imagine that takes a lot of training and a lot of practice because it's so surreal and serene looking and you're calm, but your breath wants to, you want to exhale. You want to take a breath. Yeah. It's a lot just getting used to it. It's a lot of mental strength because when you like first start wanting to breathe, you have so much longer that you can really go holding your breath, like longer than you feel. So it's more of like a mental game of getting yourself to realize that you can stay down a lot longer and convincing yourself not to go back up. How do you, what do you think about the state of Florida? Like the literal state of it? Are we okay environmentally? Are there some things that keep you up at night? There are so many environmental concerns in Florida. We could sit here and go on all day about the different things going on. Like even specifically, you know, with reptiles, we have more non-native reptiles now than we do native reptiles. Oh, wow. So just learning little things like that, you start to realize like how much ecological damage is actually going on around us. Yeah. And when you start seeing things, because the the Burmese python, those are not indigenous to uh, to Florida. Right. And so right. when you when you do the necropsy on that and you pull out a five foot gator, when you first got your hands on that, could you tell what was going to happen and then when you actually cut it open and it slides out almost fully intact. Tell me a little bit about that day. Yeah, so somebody had actually sent in a picture to our lab and they were basically like these field workers had come across this animal in the field and they went ahead and euthanized it on site, which is what you're supposed to do. And they wanted to bring it in so that we could take some scientific samples, diet study things, stuff like that. So. They brought it into our lab, and before they did that, though, they sent us a picture. So we're all sitting there, and we're looking at it, because pythons are known for eating mammals. So we were trying to decide if maybe it was some sort of mammal in there or what the python could have eaten. But as soon as they like brought it in and we stretched out the python, which literally oh. took up the entire room, you could really see like the outline of the alligator, actually. So as soon as we actually had it in our hands, we're like, oh, that's an alligator. <laughs> You knew it. And eight, that's an 18 foot Python. You've probably seen even bigger than that. I would imagine. Cause they get huge down there. Right. I haven't seen bigger. So 18 oh. feet is about the max. Like you can get a little bit bigger than that, but not much. So I always say like the biggest one I've actually physically caught just by myself is like a 12 foot one. You caught a 12, wait, you caught a 12 foot <laughs> Python out by yourself in the Everglades. Yeah. At, at, okay. Was this at night? Because right. I know a lot of the hunting takes place at night. Yeah, a lot of herping, which is like the act of looking for reptiles and amphibians, takes place at night. So you're out in the Everglades by yourself at night, and you catch a 12-foot python. Yeah. Well, I feel bad about myself now. <laughs> Worse than I did before. I think we all do. <laughs> Rosie, thank you so much for taking some time to talk to us. It was very enjoyable, and we wish you all the best. We're excited to see maybe a Netflix series or Amazon, Something. but you got to stay out of local TV. All right. You okay. don't want the competition. Yeah. Deal. All right. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you, Rosie. This is a lot of fun.
And thank you for watching Florida's Fourth Estate. You can download it from wherever you listen to podcasts or watch anytime on News 6 Plus.